Okay. So just a few comments of introduction. Um, a gentleman that hardly needs to be introduced to the group, Mr. Sid Lethbridge. Um, appreciate your involvement today, Sid. And as you can see on the screen, the topic is the H. Northwood Glass Company in Wheeling, West Virginia, and particularly the years from 1902 to 1925. And Sid, I'll let you carry on from there. Okay. Well, Carl's already done my first slide, so uh, <laughs> I'll move on to the second. The talk today is going to be on the H. Northwood Company of uh, Glass Company of Wheeling, West Virginia. This is the third and last glass company uh, uh, owned and operated by uh, uh, Harry Northwood. So let's talk a little bit about Harry Northwood. Uh, he was born in England in 1860 uh, out of a glass in a glass family. But I'm going to talk more about his North American uh, career. Uh, in late 1881, Harry Northwood came over, uh, landed in New York City, uh, looking for for work, and he ended up at the Hobbs Pecunier uh, factory in Wheeling, West Virginia, where he worked as a glass etcher between 1882 and 1884. Um, his, his, his background was uh, in the etching uh, field, uh, artist, artistry and, and etching. And so that was a great fit for him. Also with him there was uh, um, his uh, brother-in-law and uh, uh, some other relatives in the Dugan family, all as, as glass etching uh, folks. Uh, he was there for between 82 and 84 and started to, to uh, spread his wings. In 1884, he was brought over to the Lobel Glass Company of Bridgeport, Ohio. And it's not clear exactly what role he was taking in that company. Um, they talked mainly about, and the trade journals talked oh. mainly about his um, etching and a new pattern that they had brought out, which included some, some acid etching. Unfortunately, shortly after uh, Northwood got there, um, there was a huge flood on the Ohio River, which happens, still happens today. And it took the Lobel Glass Company out of business. They got themselves the factory rebuilt and along came a large strike along the uh, the Ohio River. A number of the glass companies uh, refused to to uh, give in to the union requirements, including Little Bell, who just shut their door for uh, for several years. So what's a what's a guy to do? Well he needed to put bread on the on the table, so to speak. So Harry went off to uh, Man Manaka, Pennsylvania, where he worked for the Phoenix Glass Company of, of that city. And I think this is where he learned a lot. You know, he obviously had family connections, but he also, when he was at Phoenix, uh, Joseph Webb was there making the Joseph Webb art glass, beautiful colored blown ware. Uh, we'll argue to the end of time as to how much of it they made and how much uh, might have been made by uh, Bohemian glass makers. That debate rages, but. Uh, Harry went there and he learned. And uh, after 85, uh, LaBelle decided they were going to fire back up. They made it, a number of the companies made uh, an agreement with the union. And LaBelle said, we're gonna fire, we're gonna fire back up. Harry came back and what's he, he is now the manager of the LaBelle Glass Company. Um, and they started bringing out Vera de Soie, silk glass, other colors and effects. And one of the trade journals says, where was he hiding this all these years? Well, I think he learned when he was in, in Phoenix, as well as uh, around the, the kitchen table, probably as a, as a youth. But uh, he came back to LaBelle and they started making blown, beautiful blown uh, art, 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 art glassware. But the LaBelle was a, a jinx company. So what happened next? Huge fire. <laughs> Huge fire. Shouldn't laugh because it's just one of those ones. It almost seems that every time a company gets on a roll, uh, something bad happens. And LaBelle had a, a disastrous fire. 
And again, they decided they were going to restart. They got their, they were covered by insurance. They they rebuilt their plant. But Harry Northwood and the salesman from LaBelle, uh, his last company, put their heads together and said, you know something? I think we could do something. We can uh, make our, start our own company. And what did they do? They turned around and they started the Northwood Glass Company in Martins Ferry, Martins Ferry Ohio. And he was there uh, in, in Martins Ferry for a couple of years and then uh, He's in the other head they needed before. to expand or find a more modern facility. So they moved the operations to uh, um, Elwood City in Pennsylvania. He operated both plants for a little while and then ultimately shut down the one in, in uh, Martins Ferry and uh, started up the one in Elwood City. Uh, they operated there until 95. And at the end of 95, Harry Northwood disappeared in the night and uh, uh, left town underneath the shadow and uh, started up a new company in Indiana, PA. Um, he literally stole away in the, in the night and left uh, uh, creditors, I guess that's what they are, behind him. Anyways, he went off to uh, Indiana, PA and had a very successful company there, uh, made some beautiful uh, glassware, started to move away from the more of the blown into more pressed, pressed wares. Um, 1899, uh, he, the National Glass Company came knocking on his door and said, uh, Mr. Northwood, we'd like to buy your factory and have it part of the National Glass Company, which was a, a conglomerate that was being put together in order to compete with U.S. Glass, who had been more or less taken over the tableware industry. The National Glass Company took, went to most of the independent companies and said, let's get together and maybe we can, we can fend off U.S. Glass. Maybe we can change our focus more from where it's more into uh, to lamps or some other, other area that we're not going to compete as hard. But they ended up buying 19, 19 factories. And one of them was uh, the Northwood factory and the Northwood Glass Manufacturing Company in, in uh, Indiana. Now, for some reason, they didn't want Harry sticking around, and I suspect Harry didn't want to stick around, but they, they stuck him with a non-compete, and they said, we'll give you a job in, in the UK, and we'd like you to go over to the UK and be our sales rep in, in there for, for at least, I think it was three years, um, for at least three years. Um, he did that. Again, he probably learned around his, his family's dining room table. His, he had a lot of family still there. But in 1901, he started to get the itch again. And uh, he started to explore. He came back to North America. He started to explore buying the Factory H from the U.S. Glass Company. And the U.S. Glass Company had acquired Factory H, which was the old Hobbs Pecunier uh, factory in Wheeling, West Virginia. So he made an arrangement with National to get out of the last bit of time in his non-compete. Probably they didn't have to pay him for it. They no longer had to pay him. And uh, bought this factory in, in Lindley, West Virginia, which became the H. Northwood Glass Company. And it operated from 1902 to 1925. The reason it says, it says 1919 in there is that's, the, that's when Harry Northwood passed away. So I'm looking at his career in this slide and uh, <laughs> that's kind of a background. I'm going to have to go fast in the rest because <laughs> I've got like three hours, right? Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, I could talk for several days on, on this company, uh, as we probably all well know. They made pattern lines. They made novelties. And one of the dirty little secrets is everybody thinks that they're all names. Harry North, Northwood gave numbers to everything. He just was quiet about it. Uh, if you look at his catalogs, they all have numbers, but he would give a name to a pattern as well or an effect as well. So an example would be number 19. Uh, novelties, typically it was just a number for the form. So it, they would take the same piece 
and they would, oh, there's a better example. They would take this and they would shape it in different, different manners. And each of the different shapes would have a little different number. Um, and effects, and that's really what's hard with this gentleman is that he would make a pattern like this, a line, but he would make it in different effects. Uh, might be just emerald green, or it might be made with, uh, might be made opalescent, not this one, but might be made opalescent, might be made uh, carnival glass, and those would be different effects. What we don't really know is whether he gave them different numbers or names or whether he, he just, how he did it. And then there's lots of decorations. Uh, goofus, a lot of Goofus glass came out of the Northwood companies. So I could talk forever and ever, but I'm already gonna talk just about the tableware lines because we gotta put this off someplace. And so I'm gonna talk about the lines and I'm gonna throw a lot of slides up here and we're gonna have to go a little bit in a hurry, but I'm gonna try to give you why we put them in these certain time frames. So in the fall of 1902, they got their, the factory started up in, in Wheeling and uh, the trade journal re reports are fantastic for, for helping us out with understanding what might've been made. So Harry Northwood moves again to the front with the Grecian and Roman patterns in a full line of table word and specialties, which we predict will take as well as or better than anything he has ever placed on the market. And there's this lovely, uh, wholesale assortment with three of his patterns. And I apologize, I'm going to point, but for you on the line, online, the bottom row is a pattern called Carnelian. And we know that's a, a Northwood. So that means the other two that are in here are also. Now, which one's Grecian and which one's Roman? <laughs> it's probably, we could all, we can just guess, but one of those is Roman and the other one's Grecian. I kind of like this one for, for Roman, but... Who knows? So top one's from bottom one's creation. The uh, scroll with the canthus is the was the one that appeared uh, in the middle of that last slide. It came out in the fall of 1902, and it was made in in various uh, effects. Uh, this I'm going to have to before I get to the end slide. I have a lot of people to thank, and the EAPGS. Uh, Facebook group and the pattern index is a source of a lot of these photographs, but also James Mazel. But I, I don't have everyone acknowledged because I'll have to be honest, I started this presentation in 2017. So <laughs> <laughs> I just never finished it. <laughs> but here you can see it in, in multiple different uh, effects, opalescent, uh, decorated with gold, and then a slag or mosaic uh, piece at the front. Uh, Alan Jeanette is a fantastic collector of, of Northwood, and you're going to see a number of his slides in here. And you can tell they're his slides because he uses his stair steps someplace in his house to uh, show them off. But here's the scroll of Acanthus uh, in a beautiful opalescent uh, Color. And I love these, these photographs because they show you the range of pieces that are, are in it and give you some idea of the color effect when you get a table full of them. Mm -hmm. This is in the mosaic or the purple slag. Um, Northwood introduced this effect uh, probably late 1902, early 1903. And his slag is a little bit different. It's usually a little bit lighter in color, doesn't have that same dark purple look to it. It's, it's a bit more muted. Um, lots of novelties, but this tableware line, that's the other thing that's cool about these pictures is it can be done. You can find this if you, if you look hard enough and long enough. Yeah. Ivy scroll, this one, this might be the Roman one. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, I think the acanthus scroll might be the Greek, but it's one or the other. We're not quite sure which one's which. Uh, Ivy Scroll, again, in the fall of 1902. Um, it, it's a little different blue than, than uh, we're used to seeing, but uh, it's a nice pattern. I don't, I don't think they took as well as the, uh, as the trade journal writer thought because these are a little bit hard to find. It also comes in a green. And Carnelian, a.k.a. Everglades, uh, another one. This, this came out in early 1903. Uh, blue, oh, opalescent blue, uh, ivory or custard glass 
uh, opalescent uh, canary. And recently, uh, a butter dish appeared in this that looks like it's in in uh, Northwoods Luna, which is a uh, an opaque translucent or translucent glass that he was making in the in the early early teens. That's what might have just uh, might have just uh, uh, tested out the the mold, or maybe it was an early experiment with that to try that color that he reintroduced as Luna later. Uh, Regent, oh, this is a, a gorgeous pattern. Uh, this came out in the fall of 1903. Uh, they've got many new things for the trade, the chief of which is a new line of tableware, the Regent, which is made in dark, rich colors and decorated in massive gold. The design is colonial with very handsome panel design and relief which is treated with gold, giving the article the appearance of being in a gold giraffe. I'm not sure what that is. The, it sounds like, is that a piece of jewelry? <laughs> I don't know. The colors are rich claret, royal blue, and new green. I call these jewel colors, they're dark and they're rich. <clears throat> Got a, some uh, of, the, of the royal blue in there. And then this is the, uh, uh, Amethyst. Uh, Roy, this would be the rich claret, so amethyst. Yeah. Just and it's a dark. They're yeah. dark shades, not weak or washed out, but not pastel. Saturated. Yes, they're saturated shades. And they talked about the gold here. Northwood patented the technique for for putting the gold on these. Now this isn't a good example because somebody has touched the the top up and and the bottom. But if you look at some of the examples in there. Uh, even a hundred some odd years later, they're still nice and bright and and well well adhered. So he he, he patented that technique and must have worked well. Uh, these these are all from Roger Haworth of uh, the APGS. Um, he's got a fantastic collection of this pattern. And here's there's the three jewel colors in water pitchers and tumblers. And nobody's nobody mentions in the trade journals that it comes in crystal. Of course, that's the hardest one to find, but it's also yeah. the, the least exciting, <laughs> at least to me. Yeah. If you're a true collector, it's probably the one that gets you the most excited. But I love the colors. I can't I can't deny that. Um, he's he's got some pretty amazing pieces here. A very very uh, important collection of the of the pattern. So. 1904, uh, out comes number five pattern, uh, which is probably the Reliance. And reason I got the question mark behind the Reliance is I know it's number five. I think it might be might be Reliance. And the reason we think it might be Reliance is 1904, uh, they brought out this pattern. Reliance, which is made of a high grade of glass, comes in a general line of high and flat footed press table work and sparkles brilliantly. Doesn't really look like it from the catalog picture, but it looks a lot better in, in real life. And here's where you have the butter dish and the cream. So you've got a high foot and a and a flat piece. That's really what the kind of the code words that they're using in that trade journal. So it's definitely number five. Whether it's Reliance or not, we can we can uh, we can debate. Uh, Encore is another pattern that came out that 1904. It's a new line of opalescent uh, tableware. The line comes in canary, blue, and flint opalescent, undecorated, and in the three colors decorated in ruby and gold. I find the next little sentence very interesting. A rather queer effect is produced by the gold and ruby decoration on blue and canary opalescent. So I think they, every year at, they would have a, a trade show. They bring out the new lines in, in Pittsburgh and they put them out on the tables. and. Not everything made it to market after that. Um, there's some famous stories. And I don't think I've ever seen a piece of blue opalescent or canary opalescent with a, a ruby and gold decoration on it. There might, there's probably some out there because they had to be shown at the trade show, but maybe they just got negative feedback at the trade show and didn't make much of it. Again, here's some more of, of uh, Alan's uh, wonderful collection sitting there. Uh, this this is pretty typical of a, of a Northwood set, a, a, a water set, a table set, uh, Pruitt and shakers, a, a condiment type set, and 
uh, a berry set, and that would be the core uh, right. of each of the each of the patterns that right. most of the patterns he was right. making. Uh, Mikado came out that year as well. Mikado was the name of another line, which is sort of Japanese in its effect. I think it's more than sort of. It is Japanese in its effect. The line, which, by the way, is the most expensive of the several new ones, comes in tea, lemonade, and berry sets. Lemonade would be what we would call a water set. Tea set would be what we'd, we'd call a table set. Uh, oil and salt, salt bottles, several other pieces. I don't know what the other pieces are, but it'd be nice to find them. It is a crystal frosted glass with decorations of pansies and crooked stems. You will know, you will understand what I mean by crooked stems when you see them. Now you can see them here. You can see the crooked stems are, they're angular. They're, <laughs> they're not smooth and flowing like most flowers. They're, they're quite angular. Done in four transparent colors in gold. And, uh, it's a it's a handsome pattern when you when you see it. The uh, colors are are very uh, attractive. Then you have the next next year, 1905, we're, we're another round of new patterns coming out in in uh, for the fall, and they, they come out in January. Uh, the WB uh, and the trade journal says woggle bug it means, and we're pretty sure that's not really the pattern name. It's Probably a couple of guys joking around, <clears throat> salesmen joking around. So it's be kind of, well, I hope it doesn't need, need logo. <laughs> uh, collectors call it teardrop flower, and uh, it, it's made in uh, crystal blue, green, and amethyst with a, a nice gold uh, gilt decoration. And there's uh, some examples of the, uh, of, again, this is from Roger, I believe. I'm going to throw this pattern in here because it's kind of a posy some pods. That's it, it's that's just a collector's name. We don't really know what it was called, and we're guessing it's on about 1905 based upon the way it's decorated, uh, the colors it came in, and a few pieces are marked with the N in a circle. So mm -hmm. that's maybe a clue as to when it when it uh, was introduced. Uh, the trademark N in a circle um, is brought out around 1905, uh, definitely was in use in 1906 because there's the end of 1906, there's a trade quote that says Northwood and company are proud of their glass and on each piece will be found their trademark, the circle N. Uh, that little uh, photo image to the side, that's from one of their advertisements. I haven't found the actual trademark documents to date. So some people suggest that maybe they just used it. And some people say, we just haven't found the, the trademark registration. But so 1905 is about when you, when you start to see the, the use of that, that mark, that some of the earlier patterns might have it, but only a few pieces. But after that, it starts to become more and more uh, in use. Uh, 1905, we have the diadem, diadem uh, pattern number nine. Um, very handsome pattern again. I, I say handsome. I don't. I could say pretty, but I just most of these are masculine type patterns. They're heavy and 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 not delicate. I guess that's the that's kind of sexist. I know. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Imitation cut pattern, and it, it is uh, comes in in uh, canary opalescent, blue opalescent, and uh, transparent transparent colors as well. This is a, a little bit of a puzzle. Hecock gave the name Belladonna to this pattern um, in their in their catalog, uh, 1906-1907 catalog. It's it's uh, labeled as decorated number thirty one floral. So right off the bat, okay, maybe it's the number 31 pattern. Well, let's go to the next slide. Maybe it isn't because number decorated number 32 gold band is the same blanks of the same uh, forms, but different with a different decoration. So I think the reality is we don't know exactly what the name of that pattern was, or this is a hint that every different decoration 
was given a different number. So the number 32 pattern was that decoration. The number 31 pattern was this decoration. Some other decoration would have a different number. The, the trade journals mentioned catalogs. We've got partial one to work with, but wouldn't it be nice to find four or five others to give us some answers <laughs> instead of making us our heads hurt? Uh, 1906, Southern bring out your bring out their uh, number 12 semi-cut uh, pattern. Um, it came in crystal and also gold decorated in, as the, as the trade quote says, all to the good. The trade quote also mentions some peculiarly shaped, peculiarly shaped baskets in this line. And you can kind of make them out on the uh, top two rows, second from the, uh, from the left. There's two baskets and one has a uh, they're very similar shape. I don't think when they say peculiarly shaped, I think it's the handle they're talking about. One just has a hoop handle. The other one has kind of a, a loop handle. You can see it cross over. You can just see it cross over there in the, in the center. So it's not a nice straight pick it up handle. Uh, patterns also was uh, decorated in ruby and gold and uh, green and gold. Uh, you'll notice Everything I'm showing you here is pressed. You, you you probably were thinking you're going to see a presentation of of uh, blown patterns. He did make some in in uh, in Wheeling, but really, this this turned into a press glass factory. Um, they had they had lots of uh, lemonade sets, and they had a few opalescent lines, but most of the core was was press pattern glass. Uh, this is the uh, number 12 semi-cut in, in emerald green. Uh, I would say handsome pattern, but I'd be accused of using the same words again. again. I, I went to a friend of mine, gave a talk, and he'd say, this is one of my favorite patterns, and he said it every piece he picked up. <laughs> <laughs> so I gave him a hard time. So, <laughs> so you feel free. Bear to or if I was going to start a new collection of uh, glass. It'd probably be this pattern, but it is just a gorgeous. I'll show you some pictures in a second, but I think this is the, uh, the the nicest pattern I think that this company made. But I'm a little prejudiced because I love the jewel colors. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. The new line of fancy glass from the the Northwood factory, Verdor, has caught on with the trade immensely. There is a massive richness and peculiar elegance in this colored decorated glass, entirely unlike any lines previously shown. And that it has scored an instant success is not remarkable. It is shown in both silver and gold effects. And then we have this catalog page, which is in black and white, which really doesn't do it justice. Um, but then when you see it, it's just this, the, these pictures don't do it justice either. It's just a rich, the gold is almost always good and it's big chunk of the surface. And they used it to highlight pattern and, and then the color just makes everything jump. I don't even have a single piece of this because I've never found a piece that I felt comfortable paying that much money for. <laughs> it's one of these days. <laughs> And it, it, again, in the jewel colors, this is uh, uh, an iris. Just these are gorgeous. Most of these are from the uh, J, J. Rogers, Julian Rogers collection. And it's just, just an amazing, uh, amazing pattern line. Now, here's a couple more pieces. The trade coat mentioned silver and gold, but gold is what you see. Verador, why would you make it in a silver effect? <laughs> Maybe there's another, another one we're missing out there, but... It's almost all, all everything I've seen is in, in gold. And, and it like he patented the process for applying the gold and clearly he used it again here because it, it keeps really well. There's lots of patterns where the gold kind of disappears over time, but these are, these are just gorgeous. There, I used a different word. <laughs> 1907, we, we have uh, the Regal line. If this is a collector's name, we don't know what they called it. And 
we put it to this period because of uh, a trade quote that mentions a block colonial in opalescent blue and gold and a block colonial in plain opalescent. That I went back and checked that quote, and that's what they said, but I almost think that they missed a word when they when they types typeset it or whatever, because mm -hmm. you know, in Mary opalescent, maybe, <laughs> or <laughs> I, I'm not sure. Uh, another example of, of the Northwood uh, uh, typical, there's also a jelly compound in there. And at the top, there's a, a smaller, uh, smaller nappy on, on the top shelf. Okay, 1907, we're looking at the golden cherry. And the only hint that we have is to, when this came out, was a trade quote talking about a new line that replaced the golden cherry of last season. And that, that was in the 1908 uh, trade quote. So we're assuming that Golden Cherry or Cherry and Cable came out in 1907. And uh, this, this little catalog cut here, uh, you can see the picture there, but notice the tumbler. At the bottom of the picture, there's like little thumbnails or thumbprints. They're not on the, not on the tumbler. So that's caused some confusion for folks in the past, but uh, that's, that's their, their correct. Tumbler. And here's the set sitting on a on a uh, the Alan's uh, shelf again. Um, if you like cherries and you like purple and you like gold, it's a nice set. <laughs> but I, I really like the jewel colors. <laughs> he stopped making them. <laughs> You're in this business to make money, so you make what sells. And if that was old news. You don't make it anymore. You move on to the next best thing. Uh, number 19, also known as Memphis, uh, came out in 1908. It's an imitation cut pattern, which comes in crystal and topaz. And uh, I've got a piece here. And in the bottom of it, they nicely left oh, a, a uh, 19. Northwood oh, mark. You can't see it from there, but you have a look afterwards. You can see the, the end in a circle and right in the bottom of it. Um, what is topaz? Well, we'll have a look in a second here, but uh, there, there it is decorated in gold. It also comes in emerald green. You, those of you online, you can't see it, but I've got a, an emerald green uh, piece of my hand here. Uh, and then it comes in topaz, which is the trade term for uh, canary or Vaseline. And uh, there is a handful of pieces in this pattern in this color um i i know that there's also a cream we've got this this butter where there's two there's more but there aren't very many more so this not have been a, a good seller some patterns just you know the canary is great but you lose the pattern so easily in that so maybe maybe it just didn't sell or maybe there was expense related reasons mm -hmm. or Maybe it's because uh, carnival glass started to come into effect, what we call carnival glass. And this pattern uh, was also made with carnival effects. Um, here's a couple of uh, punch sets in, uh, in their emerald and uh, in their azure uh, uh, carnival effects. Golden Holly was the uh, pattern that uh, replaced the uh, the uh, Golden Cherry, and I'm gonna I'm gonna say it again. This is a gorgeous pattern. I think this one's more than handsome. It's gorgeous <laughs> in this particular effect uh, with the, the the green decorated leaves and the red berries, and then with that snow at the top with the opalescent, the crystal opalescent. It is just a a beautiful beautiful pattern. Uh, I'm not sure it went one better than the the the, uh, the uh, golden cherry of the year before, but uh, this is this is a very uh, highly sought after pattern, and it came in in multiple colors, including uh, just some more crystal opalescent uh, decorated uh, in an emerald green, which also Holly looks great in with gold decoration. Uh, it came in an opalescent blue as well. If I showed every every slide and every picture that. There is, I'd be here for a year. Uh, Luster Flute came out in 1908, and we have that dating based upon uh, trade, a 
not trade journals, uh, wholesale catalogs. Uh, it's called Golden Opalescent here, uh, which would be probably a, a, a flint opalescent or a crystal opalescent white uh, with uh, gold decoration. Also came in a blue opalescent and uh, various different uh, carnival effects. Uh, number 21, also known as flute, came out in 1908. Another, another colonial <laughs> design <laughs> made in five different colors. There's a lot of colonial patterns out there for those of you that uh, study this period. It drives all of us crazy because they all look very similar. Uh, this is uh, that pattern also in a in the uh, golden iris, a uh, carnival effect. You're starting to see these patterns they're transitional. They, they might have started in one effect, but they start moving into uh, the, the carnival or, or uh, iris effects. Because in 1909, um, they brought out golden iris. And I'm going to read this whole trade quote to you. Iridescent glass put out by the Fenton Art Glass Company, Williamstown, West Virginia, and known to the manufacturers as ruby glass, R-U-B-I glass, has been enjoying a great sale, especially in the 10 cent stores. H. Northwood and Company have just produced a line almost identical in color with the Fenton output. It will be called Golden Iris. The number of shapes and clever application of coloring possible at this remarkable plant ensure almost a craze for the goods. It seems a pity that a glass so much like the Tiffany for real product Tiffany must have been shuddering to be <laughs> compared to this. <laughs> Save in weight should find the counters of the cheap stores. However, these are days when a heavy bulk production is necessary to make even a light profit and sentiment rarely outweighs dollars when payrolls are to be considered. That's pretty. <laughs> See, looks pretty good. Not nearly as good as the Tiffany, but it'll sell better. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think they're probably happy with that trade, that trade journal. But uh, here's a, a, a catalog page of the Golden Iris. It, it's got a lot of green in it. But mm -hmm. I don't know whether that's because um, the catalog page is faded with time or whether, uh, but they called it Golden Iris. And I'm going to. There was different irises, so this might not actually be golden iris because he had another effect uh, called, uh, I'll get to that slide in a second, but this is a page of the golden iris and, and you can see that some of that uh, luster flute pattern at the bottom and a various numbers of uh, novelty pieces at the, at the top. Uh, grape and Cable was brought out in 1910, around 1910, and this is probably the peak of Northwood's uh, carnival glass coloring. Um, this pattern, this huge pattern, made in numerous forms and made in every carnival glass shade under the under the sun. Well, not a, everyone. There's probably a few that it didn't was made in, and then it was re re recycled later, which I'll get to. These are from uh, the Northwood uh, Wheeling, West Virginia book. And our courtesy of James, Dr. James Macell, who uh, gave permission for them to be used. And there's just a, a couple of slides of, of various different. This is a big line. It's not the little three three sets. It's it's a big line because he had a good seller, and he had this uh, iris, golden iris, and various other effects that were selling. So they just kept bringing out pieces in this in this pattern, decanters. Uh, Candlesticks, table sets, uh, candle lamps, big bowls, punch bowls, and look at the different effects that it uh, was made in um, from kind of the, the uh, emerald to the metallic metallic purple. I'm not a big carnival glass fan, but I'll, I'll admit that these things are pretty pretty uh, pretty nice. I'm not starting a new collection. <laughs> Just to cover his bases, the same year they brought out a, a pattern that collectors call gold gold rose. There was some thought at one point in time that this was the the uh, the uh, 
manufacturer's name, which it, it might might have been, given his his ten, tendency to use golden rose, golden cherry, but we don't know. Um, it, it was used in this uh, uh, wholesale advertisement, but that doesn't mean it was actually the, the manufacturer's name. Here it is with a with a uh, more uh, maiden's blush type type uh, decoration with gold. Um, and gold and cherry lattice. This is another pattern uh, you brought out about 1911. It's got a, a lattice work behind it, hence the name cherry, cherry lattice and cherries in front, cherry lattice. Um, I'm, I'm going to say this ad looks a lot better than it does in, in real life. <laughs> That's the purpose of ads, isn't it? There it is in real life. It just doesn't have that same pizzazz. Maybe if you had it this close to you, but I, I just don't think so. Uh, singing birds was, is another pattern that came out. It's, it came out around 1911 and it, as a carnival line. Um, later on, it was made in, in a, a crystal crystal decorated effect. But there's a nice little ad. You could buy a four please table set of it uh, with a coupons with a coupon for 49 cents. That yeah, <laughs> it's probably expensive at the time, but. Uh, then acorn burrs was also right at the same time. And this is a strong pattern. Um, it, it really is three-dimensional. Um, There's no burrs. The, uh, this is a, the uh, punch bowl, $1.60 for the set. Uh, but first, before I start showing you the pictures of that, I'm going to talk about some of these different iris effects. And... Uh, I see that I've uh, done a, a, a copy and paste error. So ignore the title. <laughs> Fall 1909 and 1910 is correct, but it should say Golden I was promoted in Florentine. Oh, uh, let's we'll see what happened in the next slide. <laughs> uh, Golden I was promoted in Florentine lines were the, the names that he, that Northwood used for his uh, three of his effects. Uh, the beautiful tints in this wear, changing from hue to hue in reflected light, have gained for it a place by itself in the world of glass. And I, I've used the uh, acorn and burrs, the punch bowl, as, as the, the venue to, to show you these effects. So this is the golden iris. It's that marigold uh, uh, carnival. Uh, Florentine is a special pride as the new Florentine wear. Uh, made by the Northwood people. It's entirely new. The color in iridescent with purplish cast is exclusive. This company being the only producers of it in this country. Up to that minute, maybe. I think other people did, but it's there it is. It is steely, steely purple. Um, again, you can see that picture. You can really see how three-dimensional this pattern is, how much, how much the pattern sticks out from the, from the body of the, of the, uh, of the uh, punch punch bowls, Pomona was the the third effect, and it's it's a green uh, metallic green uh, carnival. Oh, this this one's right. Azure pure azure pearl and emerald were brought out in 1912, and many new treatments in tableware lines of iridescent glass, prominently amongst which are three color treatments, which they call azure, pure, pearl, and emerald. I have trouble saying those words in, in order. <laughs> They're a softer tone than anything that has been produced heretofore in this kind of glass, and the new effects are very pleasing. As indicated by the names, the colors are light blue, pearl, and green. <laughs> but to say that either, either name fittingly describes the color would be incorrect. And this is the azure effect. Um, a soft pastel blue. I think this this looks gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> there, got away from Hansen. Emerald. This is a pastel green. I, I don't know why they would call it emerald. The first one more more emerald to me than this, but that's marketing. And then pearl, and it's a it's called white carnival. It's a uh, uh, crystal glass with the with a. Without opalescence, it's just got a, a, a light uh, pastel uh, iridescence on it. And then we have this one, which we don't know what Northwood called it. It's not mentioned. It, this was, the collectors call this aqua opalescent. 
Remember I showed you that slide where you get that punch bowl for $1.60? This punch bowl sold here, this punch bowl sold for $172,000 in the last year. This punch set, $172,000. $172,000 in, in the last year. You must have 12 cups too. I don't know. <laughs> I think people, some people might be just happy to have a cup. I don't know. Um, I'll have to say, I, I like the other ones better than this one. <laughs> maybe that's why there's not much of this around because maybe it didn't have, the, as, as, didn't sell as well. But that's what makes something collectible is when it's rare, hard to find. And uh, this one is one that's uh, clearly very, very hard to find and very uh, sought after. Um, I can't say. No, I just won't. Okay, Strawberry and Cable, uh, about 1912. And this is mentioned in a, uh, a trade quote, gives us a clue. Strawberry and gold decoration and tableware that has all the earmarks of being a big seller. You notice how there's all, always going to be a big seller, but sometimes these are hard to find. So maybe they were. In this case, in, in this Ladder, the decoration is in relief, the strawberry plant being the motif with the leaves in gold and the berries in natural color. We don't have a catalog, but great quotes like that tell us, point us to the right. Most of these are all marked. I forgot to say that now. Everything after about 1905, 1906, they're all, they're all marked. That, that changes a little, again, a little bit later, but uh, uh, most of these are marked. Peacock at the Fountain was uh, brought out in 1912. This is a, a showing the traditional uh, three sets that Northwood put out. Uh, it was made in a variety of, uh, of uh, carnival effects and uh, also uh, an ivory effect. There's some more of that opalescent to fear. This one's probably a lot less, but still probably a lot of money. And just to throw us off, Northwood patented the pattern in 1914. So why did he bring out a pattern in 1912 and not patent until 1914? It's called uh, closing the barn door after the, after the horse is out. He brought that pattern out in 1912. Well, who copied it? Fenton copied it. <laughs> and uh, uh, the, the Dugans, which are brother, brother-in-law, somehow related to uh, Northwood uncles. I'm not sure, but they were related to, to Northwood. They brought out their own version within uh, a short period of time. So he patented it, but two years after is, is way too late. Um, but the damage is already done. Maybe they had to stop selling it, or maybe they had already got out of it. But uh, the, the horse had left the barn. In 1914, uh, we're starting to see a swing again away from the, the carnival glass. It's hit its peak, it's starting to, to slow down, but it's not done yet. Uh, Northwood re reintroduced another one of his concepts. He made ivory in, in uh, Indiana. He made it in early days at, uh, in, in Wheeling. So in 1914, he brought out a striking new glass, which has been called the ivory, named the ivory line so-called because of the rich ivory color of the glass, which has a faint iridescence. You can just see that on that plate and a broad edge band of gold. And this is, I think I showed this plate in Verador earlier, if not a sort of similar one, but it's, it's a Verador plate that's been, the mold's been pulled out, reused and pressed in this ivory or custard pattern or custard color. And then you could just see the iridescence on that, just faintly. Um, so he brought that out in 1914. You can argue whether he was ahead or behind the market. Sometimes he was ahead of the market. Sometimes he was behind. Like he was not the first in the carnival glass, but he made a big splash. Um, he wasn't the first into the ivory, but he made a big splash. Um, great with Gothic arches uh, was brought out in the ivory. Ivory effect in 1940. People will tell you this pattern's earlier, but I really think this one is a 1914 pattern. I use that, I'll, I won't repeat the same quote that I used for the last one, but which has a faint iridescence and a broad edge band of gold, comma, included, sorry, period, included among the patterns are a great design. But 
I think this is, uh, and this has also got a little bit of iridescence on it. It's a little bit hard to see, but it's got a little iridescence. So it looks like the grape with Gothic arches came out around 1914. It's also with a, a gold uh, green glass with table with a gold treatment. Well, there's the uh, green glass with, with gold treatment. So ideas recycled. There's some thoughts that these are earlier because of that, because of the ivory and the, not the ivory, but because of the green that was earlier. Mm -hmm. But I think you recycled the ideas and said, you know something, that pattern looked pretty good that we made five years ago. Maybe we should try something similar, see whether the market's ready for it or not. Who knows? Uh, they also brought out in the fall of 1914, a, a slightly different version of, uh, of the ivory, which they called antique ivory. And antique ivory, the effect is at once unusual and attractive and is particularly pleasing in a classic design, having a conventionalized grape motif. There's that grape uh, lattice, grape with Gothic arches pattern. Uh, it, it's an ivory, ivory glass or custard glass, and it has a kind of a, a brownie wash on it. Uh, nutmeg. Nutmeg. <laughs> and it's not the most beautiful glass. I, I will say that. <laughs> we agree. <laughs> the, uh, this is an example. Out of, sorry, Jude. <laughs> out of Judy's, uh, I had to steal stuff out of Judy's collection to for, <laughs> stop the show today. <laughs> and there's a, but there's a lot of this pattern. If you like it, you like it. Uh, they pulled out their uh, grape and cable line and said, hey, this, I think this ivory was a, was a seller for them because there's a lot of it. Yeah. So, you know, think of, he brought out that, that great one. He says, I'm selling this, pull out those, those old molds. They got grapes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's fire huh. them back up. That might be what happened. Other people will say, no, this is the great design that was being talked about in that uh, uh, great quote. I don't think it is, but that's my opinion. Other people have different opinions and they're quite welcome to them. Singing birds, uh, we showed you uh, the carnival glass version earlier, 1916, talk about recycling. A new blue bluebird pattern, not really new. The line includes jugs and tumblers, bowls, covered jars, trays, sugars and creams, footed compotes, et cetera, and a novel footed compote with cover. I really don't know what those look like. We'll have to keep looking. The shapes are colonial. Yeah, kind of. And the decoration consists of bluebirds in different attitudes perched on flowered twigs. The entire design is embossed and the flowers and twigs are attractively colored. Okay, what else was happening around the same time period? Other companies were bringing out a very simple blown wear with bluebirds painted on them. Harry said, I've got, I've got molds sitting in the morgue. They've already got the birds. All we got to do is press them and paint them. <laughs> I've got a new bluebird pattern. Maybe that's what happened. Maybe it isn't. Um, I think it looks better with the blue decoration than it did in the carnival, but I like blue. It's full disclosure. Close. And there's a, a fair bit in this, uh, again, the, the standard Northwood sets. Uh, 1917, the, uh, the 1914 uh, World War I uh, commenced in Europe, and it impacted the glass industry in North America as well because of uh, the lack of uh, access to manganese dioxide. So I think that you, you, we're going to look at a couple of patterns here where bright crystal glass isn't needed. And maybe that's, maybe that's why um, this is their marble effect. And it's, it's also called greciated marble in other trade quotes. Um, marble glass has the same peculiarly fascinating finish as real marble with dark irregular veins running through it and is made in vases, puff jars, hair receivers, bird fonts, tobacco jars, etc. It's not really a tableware line, but I thought it looked pretty cool, so I, I threw it in. Um, they also made an Etruscan effect in 1917, and um, similar effect to make it look like a, a, a natural mineral or a rock, I think, um, but it also, um, 
doesn't need bright crystal glass. So maybe they were looking for something that they could make without uh, um, manganese dioxide, which there was other decolorants that could be used, but you have to think this is something that can just happen overnight. They have to do experimenting. So 1917, uh, Harry once again goes back to recycle and brings out a pattern that they call satin sheen or iris or iridescent, depending on what time period you're looking at for the, uh, the trade post. A brilliant new line of iridescent glassware called satin sheen produced by the H. Northwood Company. The iridescence is brought out in an exquisite blue, purple, and a very beautiful pearl. This is stretch glass. So it's got an iridescent surface and some of them is more, they, they've got a, something called cobweb, which is more, mm -hmm. more stretched, but this is all what people call uh, stretch glass. Um, there's a, a catalog advertisement there and the top is the, the topaz and the bottom is, is blue. I don't know whether the candlesticks are the pearl or not. Um, they don't look, they look kind of blue to me, but uh, this is uh, again from the uh, courtesy of, of Dr. James Maisel, uh, blue iris around 1917, topaz iris. Um, I don't really have a picture of the pearl People get more excited about the colors than they do uh, uh, anything else. This 1919 is where uh, we lost uh, Harry Northwood. Um, trade quote was in the death of Harry Northwood, who was passed who passed away at his home in William, West Virginia, last week. The glass trade lost one of its most popular members, and this is the end of an era. His brother passed away either just before or just after. Um, I think just before, um, I'm not 100% sure of that. I should have that all in my head, but I can only hold so much. So that, that's a, a, a shift uh, change for, a sea change, sea change for the Northwood Company. Uh, Harry Northwood and his brother Carl, who were the, essentially the, the guy that came up with the design, the ideas, and the guy that did most of the selling, uh, disappeared in 1919, just after the war, but they didn't stop making glass, they still went on until 1925, but this is really the end of the Harry Northwood period. And after that, it's, well, I shouldn't say, it's the people that were there probably did a very good job. They they continued to, to uh, bring out some patterns. The ones I've been showing you the last few slides, they called it their rainbow line and they're fairly simple shapes. Um, they just changed the color effects with topaz iris or, Topaz iridescence or topaz satin sheen, whatever you wanted to call it, or pearl. In 1922, they brought out another color. Uh, they brought out two colors, actually. One was jade blue, which I'll talk about in a second. The other was russet. Both are iridescent effect and most charming. The russet is transparent and, as the name would suggest, strongly suggests a rich russet apple color. Now, full disclosure here, I love russet apples. this one in there. The next, uh, this is a page again from courtesy of Dr. James Maisel of the color. I don't think it's that great a looking color, but they were looking for something that might be different in the market. And, uh, you know, this I like. Jay, Jay Blue came out in the, the same 1922, and it's they call it translucent. It's not quite opaque, but it's not really mm -hmm. transparent either. So translucent. Uh, it is a rich luster, much after the order of a turquoise and somewhat suggestive of, of a robin's egg. So, or we call it Jade Blue. I think robin's egg blue would be a cool name to call it. Uh, again, it was made in a, in a range of these smooth, organic type shapes. Um, uh, iridescent as well. Some of these may also be made non-iridescent. I'm, I'm getting out of the, I'm getting way past my my uh, uh, area. They also made a jade green around 1924. 
And this is pretty well at the end of the Northwood Glass Company. In 1925, they, uh, they went out of business. And sorry, I forgot. Chinese coral. How could I forget Chinese coral? This is a neat color. Um, it's black. Difference. It has to go from muddy to a nice red color, depending on uh, other companies made it. Fenton. Uh, I know Fenton did for sure. I think maybe Dugan or Diamond at that time. I'm not sure exactly who, but uh, this was a, a color that Northwood uh, brought out in 1924. But these are, again, after Harry Northwood was no longer with the company. You don't know how much of his influence was on it, whether he had experimented with colors earlier or not. But um, So I'm going to finish up with just one novelty item. I could talk about novelties for as long as I talked about this, which you don't really want. <laughs> this is a, a pattern called beaded cable. And uh, Judy has an example here of it. Uh, this is in uh, some kind of a carnival finish. But it was made in all kinds of different effects. So here we've got uh, Mosaic, wrote 1903. Top row, the second one is the opalescent, blue opalescent, again, about 1903. Uh, then at the bottom row, we have uh, Golden Iris, Florin Florentine, and, and Pomona. I think it's Pomona then. Carnival glass colors are hard to uh, assess. Azure, pearl, and emerald, and then aqua opalescent again, and then uh, the antique ivory. So there's an example of, of a item that was in the line from 1902, 1903, all the way up to 1914, and probably beyond. Those are the examples I can find. There are probably other effects out there that it was made in, and that's what I find cool about. If I was going to start a new collection, but I'm not going to be with Judy, but Rose Bowls. But Judy could make a whole collection of just this yeah. pattern <laughs> or this novelty. Yeah. Oh, I have to, many people to acknowledge uh, Dr. James Mizell, who very graciously uh, gave permission to use images from uh, the, the books that I mentioned, Bill Heacock. The Early American Pattern Glass Society, both the Facebook group and the, the Pattern Index. Alan Jeanette, I used his pictures throughout. Uh, Jeff Evans and Associates, Ed Perva, uh, he provided that, uh, that tumbler, the, the uh, Holly tumbler in there. Oh, yeah. um, Roger Haworth, uh, Jay Rogers, Jim Thielen, Carnival Glass Show Showcase, who have been very helpful in allowing me to use pictures in, in, from their, their site. Glenn and Stephen uh, Thistlewood, David Doty's Carnival Glass, Seek Auctions, and many, many, many more, because I can't remember everybody's picture that I borrowed. 